Welcome to Sleepy Eyes. I am your host, Varga. I take you on a journey in the dark of the night with warm tales. Take a moment to relax your body and mind with the current calmness. Breathe deeply, feel the energy inside, and let go of any tiredness. Put aside the past and focus on the peacefulness of the present moment. Recognize any tension in your body. Allow it to fade away and unwind. Discover your inner peace and simply unwind in the tranquility of now. Before going to sleep, prepare to read a story comfortably in this peaceful setting. Let the magic of words captivate you as you get lost in a tale or story. With the warmth from this peace and relaxation, your sleep will become even more serene. Close your eyes, embark on a journey with a touch of words. Let each word guide you a bit deeper toward the essence of your inner peace. Now, relax and enjoy the pleasure of getting lost in the enchanting world of the story before drifting into sleep. Sherlock Holmes Short Stories Writer Sir Arthur Conan Doyle The Disappearance of Lady Frances Carfax Part 1 Turkish Watson asked Sherlock Holmes, looking at my shoes. No, they are English, of course, I answered. I bought them here in London, at Latimer's in Oxford Street. Holmes smiled. I was not talking about your shoes, Watson, he said. I was talking about the bath. You have had a Turkish bath today, haven't you? Yes, I have. But how did you know that, Holmes? My dear Watson, I looked at your shoes. Perhaps I am a little slow, I said, but I don't understand how a pair of English shoes and a Turkish bath can be connected. Won't you explain? It is very simple, he said. You are in the habit of tying your shoes in a particular way, but today they are tied with a beautiful double knot, so it is clear that you have taken them off and somebody else has tied them for you. Who was this person? A man in a shoe shop? No. You bought some new shoes only a week ago. It was not a man in a shoe shop. It was the servant at the Turkish bath. It is simple, isn't it? And why, Watson, did you go to the Turkish bath? Because I've been feeling old and ill for the last few days. A Turkish bath usually makes me feel well again. You need a change, Watson. I suggest Switzerland. Would you like to stay at the best hotel in Lausanne? You would live like a king, and it would be completely free, and of course you would travel first class on the train. That would be wonderful, I said. But why are you offering me an opportunity like this? Holmes did not answer. Instead, he leaned back in his chair and took his notebook from his pocket. Unmarried women who wander around the world from one hotel to another put themselves in great danger from evil people. If such a lady disappears, nobody misses her. I very much fear that some terrible harm has come to Lady Frances Carfax, he said finally. Lady Frances, he continued, is the last member of her direct family. Her father and her brothers are all dead, but the family fortune followed the male line. She is not a rich woman, but she has some fine old Spanish silver jewelry and some very unusual and beautiful diamonds. She loves this jewelry so much that she has always refused to leave it at her bank for safety, so she carries her diamonds with her wherever she goes. I feel sorry for Lady Frances Carfax, Watson. She is still quite young and beautiful, but she is completely alone in the world. And what has happened to her? I asked. Ah, Watson, that is the mystery we have to solve. I don't even know whether she is alive or dead. She is a lady of very regular habits, and for the last four years she has written a letter every two weeks to her old nurse. The nurse, whose name is Miss Dobney, Fives in Camberwell, here in London. It is Miss Dobney who has asked for my help. 
Lady Frances has not written to her for nearly five weeks. Her last letter came from the National Hotel in Lausanne. The manager of the hotel says that the lady left without telling anybody her new address. Miss Dobney is very anxious about her, and so are Lady Frances's rich cousins. We shall not run short of money, Watson. Is Miss Dobney the only person Lady Frances writes to here in England? No. There is also the manager of her bank. I have talked to him. He showed me her used checks, and there were two recent ones. The first was for a very large amount, much more than enough to pay her hotel bill. The second check was for fifty pounds, and was made out to Miss Marie Devine. The money was paid to Miss Devine less than three weeks ago, at a bank in Montpellier, in the south of France. And who is Miss Marie Devine? I asked. I have already found that out, Holmes answered. She was Lady Frances's maid. I have not yet found out why Lady Frances gave her that check, but I have no doubt that you will be able to discover the reason. I, Holmes. Yes, Watson, that was why I suggested a holiday in Switzerland. You know that I cannot possibly leave London just now. The London police would feel lonely if I went abroad. So you must go, Watson. Send me a telegram if you need my advice. Two days later, I was at the National Hotel in Lausanne. The manager, Mr. Moser, told me that Lady Frances had stayed there for several weeks. Everyone who met her had liked her very much. She was not more than forty years old. Mr. Moser did not know that she had any valuable jewelry, but the servants had noticed that there was one large heavy box that was always locked. Marie Devine was as popular as Lady Frances herself. In fact, she was going to marry one of the waiters at the hotel, so I had no difficulty in getting her address. It was 11 Rue de Trajan, Montpellier, France. I wrote all this down in a little notebook. I was proud of my cleverness. Holmes himself could not have collected more facts. But the biggest mystery still remained. What was the reason for Lady Frances's sudden decision to leave? She was very happy in Lausanne. Everyone had expected her to stay for several months. She had had lovely rooms with a view of Lake Geneva, but she had left so suddenly. She had even paid a week's rent for nothing. Mr. Moser could not understand it, only Jules Vibard. The waiter who was going to marry Marie Devine was able to give me any useful information. A day or two before Lady Frances left, a tall, dark man with a beard had visited the hotel, the sort of man that you would think twice before offending. He looked like a wild animal, cried Jules Vibard. The man had rooms somewhere in the town, and Vibar and Marie had seen him by the lake with Lady Frances, talking very earnestly to her. The next time the man came to the hotel, though, Lady Frances had refused to see him. He was English, but Vibar did not know his name. Lady Frances had left Lausanne immediately afterwards. Vibart and Marie both thought that the strange Englishman's visit was the cause of Lady Frances's decision to leave. I asked Vibar why Marie had left her post, but he refused to answer. I cannot tell you that, sir, he said. If you want to find out, you must go to Montpellier and ask Marie herself. After my conversations with Mr. Moser and Vibar, I tried to find out where Lady Frances had traveled to from Lausanne. Perhaps Lady Frances had been trying to escape from someone. Certainly. It was strange that her cases and boxes had not been clearly marked. She had, though, reached Baden-Baden in Germany after a very long and indirect journey. I found this out from one of the local travel companies. I therefore bought a ticket to Baden-Baden myself. Before I left Lausanne, I sent Holmes a telegram, giving him an account of everything I had done. In his reply, he said that he was proud of me, but I did not know whether he was joking or serious. At Baden-Baden I was told that Lady Frances had stayed at the English hotel for two weeks. At the hotel she had met a man called Dr. Schlesinger and his wife. Dr. Schlesinger was a religious man 
who had been working in South America where he had fallen ill. Lady Frances herself was a very religious woman, and for her it was an honor to know such a man. She gladly helped Mrs. Schlesinger to look after him, and he used to sit all day outside the hotel with one of the ladies on each side of him, reading and writing on religious matters. Finally, when Dr. Schlesinger's health had improved a little, he and his wife had returned to London. Lady Frances had gone with them, and Dr. Schlesinger had paid her hotel bill. It was now three weeks since they had left. I asked the manager about Marie Devine, Lady Frances's maid. She left a few days before the Schlesingers, and Lady Frances went to England, he answered. She was crying bitterly, and she told me that she never wanted to work as a servant again. The manager went on, after a pause. You are not the first person who has asked for information about Lady Frances Carfax. About a week ago, another Englishman came here, asking questions about her. Did he tell you his name? I asked. No, he was a very strange man. Did he look like a wild animal? I was thinking of what Jules Vibar had told me in Lausanne. Yes, a wild animal, said the manager. That is a perfect description of him. He was a large man with a sunburnt face and a beard. I would not like to be his enemy. Already the solution to the mystery was becoming clear. This evil, cruel man was chasing the poor lady from place to place. It was obvious that she was terribly afraid of him, otherwise she would not have left Lausanne, and now he had followed her as far as Baden-Baden. Sooner or later he would catch up with her. Had he already caught up with her, perhaps? Was that the explanation for her disappearance? I just hoped that the good Dr. Schlesinger and his wife would be able to protect her from this evil man. In another telegram to Holmes, I told him that I had discovered who was to blame for her continuing disappearance, but instead of a reply, I received this. Describe Dr. Schlesinger's left ear, please. Holmes. Holmes's little joke did not amuse me. In fact, I was rather annoyed by it. Next, I went to Montpellier to see Marie Devine. She was very helpful. She had been fond of Lady Frances and completely loyal to her, she said. But recently, Lady Frances had not been kind to her and had even once accused her of stealing. I asked her about the check for 50 pounds. It was a present, sir, she replied. I am going to be married soon. We then spoke of the strange Englishman. Ah, he is a bad man, sir, said Marie. A violent man. I myself have seen him seize Lady Frances by the wrist and hurt her. It was by the lake at Lausanne, sir. Marie was sure that fear of this man was the cause of Lady Frances's sudden journeys. The poor lady was trying to escape from him. But look, sir, Marie suddenly said. He's out there, the man himself. She sounded frightened. I looked out of the window. A very tall, dark man with a large black beard was walking slowly down the center of the street, looking up at the numbers of the houses. It was clear that, like myself, he was looking for Marie. I ran out of the house and spoke to him angrily. You are an Englishman, I said. I don't want to speak to you, he said rudely. May I ask what your name is? No, you may not, he answered. It was a difficult situation. The only way to deal with it was to use the direct method of shock. Where is Lady Frances Carfax? I asked. He looked at me in surprise. What have you done with her? I continued. Why have you been following her? I want an answer from you immediately. The man gave a shout of anger and jumped on me. I am not a weak man, but he was as strong as a horse. He fought like a devil, and soon his hands were round my throat. I was nearly unconscious when a French workman rushed out of a small hotel and saved me. He struck the Englishman on the arm with his stick. This made him loosen his hold on my throat. The wild man then stood near us for a moment, unable to decide whether to attack me again. Finally, he turned angrily away and went into the house where Marie lived. I began to thank the kind Frenchman beside me. Well, Watson, the Frenchman said, 
You haven't done very well this time. I think you had better come back with me to London by the night train. An hour later, Sherlock Holmes, wearing his own clothes now, was with me in my private sitting room at my hotel. I did not expect to be able to get away from London, he said, but here I am after all. And how did you know that I would be here in Montpellier? I asked him. It was easy to guess that Montpellier would be the next stage of your travels, Holmes said. Since I arrived, I have been sitting in that small hotel, waiting for you. And really, Watson, what a situation you have got into. Perhaps you would not have done any better yourself, I answered, annoyed. I have done better, Watson. Just then, one of the hotel servants brought somebody's card in. Holmes looked at it. Ah, here is Mr. Philip Green. Mr. Green is staying at this hotel, and he may be able to help us to find out what has happened to Lady Frances Carfax.